Superman's first appearance in Action Comics No. 1, 1938, tried to explain his power scientifically. Initially, Superman's abilities were modest. He could leap an eighth of a mile, hurdle a 20-story building, but not fly. He could lift cars and trains. He could run faster than a locomotive and withstand bullets, but not artillery. Now, his powers come from Earth's yellow sun, which we will explore. His powers evolved over time. X-ray vision appeared in Action Comics number 11 in 1939, Super Breath in Action Comics number 20 in 1940, and Freezing Breath by 1959. In the early 1940s, animators found it easier to depict him flying instead of leaping, a change that comics followed. A sidebar on fixing problems by just doing the easier thing. It was less work to animate Superman flying. Indeed, the very first animation I did was of a hero flying through a mountain valley. Ease of printing was why the Hulk is green. Hulk was originally meant to be gray. In subtractive color, printing with ink or CMY. Gray is an even mix of cyan, magenta, and yellow, but any imbalance in the printing ink gave Hulk varying tints in the printing run. So it was easier to just make him green. He still had inconsistent color, but all the shades looked like green. Kryptonite first appeared in the Adventures of Superman radio show in June 1943. Sidebar number two on Kryptonite. The idea of Kryptonite fragments reaching Earth is astronomically improbable and we can demonstrate this using a combination of physics principles. First, consider the inverse square law, normally used to measure decreasing radiant energy over distance. Specifically, the intensity of radiant energy, like a flash from a camera, decreases proportionally to the square of the distance from that source. Instead of measuring photons, we'll measure all the debris that exploded outward from krypton. When krypton exploded, debris, including kryptonite, would have spread outward in all directions. This means the concentration of those fragments would decrease exponentially with distance. The sheer distance between star systems means the fragments would become incredibly dispersed. Even within our local stellar neighborhood, a sphere roughly 100 light years in radius, the time it would take for any fragment to reach Earth would be astronomical. At a very generous 50,000 miles per hour, it would take tens of thousands of years to travel just one light year. The nearest star is over four light years. So, even if Krypton were within our local neighborhood, it would take an absurd amount of time for any significant amount of debris to reach Earth. Adding to these improbabilities, kryptonite is radioactive and possesses a half-life. For instance, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years, and in that time, to put it very simply, half of the plutonium would transform into uranium, and simultaneously, the uranium is working more slowly to transform into lead. Highly radioactive substances decay quickly. Kryptonite's potent effect on Kryptonians suggests it's emitting a significant amount of radiation. It would decay quickly and would not last for the vast distances of space travel. Sidebar over. As stated, Originally, Superman's powers were based on his Kryptonian physiology. He was simply a very strong guy with bulletproof skin. He was an alien Luke Cage. But in Action Comics number 262 in 1960, it was established that Superman's powers are derived from Earth's yellow sun and that Krypton orbited a red sun. Superman is depicted as a solar battery, stronger the more sun he absorbs. He's often depicted as completely human without solar energy. But how much power can he receive from the sun shining on him? Your solar roofer would like to know. There is an energy transfer going on, but seems like Superman puts out more power than he's getting. The average man has a surface area of 1.5 to 2 square meters. Superman is a big, beefy guy. We'll allow him a little extra surface area with an estimated 2.5 square meters, about 27 square feet. That would be a 9 by 3 panel if you flatten Superman comparing him to solar panels, which produce 150 to 200 watts per square meter, it suggests he could generate 375 to 500 watts under ideal conditions. Even with 100% efficiency, this is only 2.5 kilowatts, roughly the power of two microwave ovens. I can hear some viewers gathering their pitchforks. Please note, 
I am not referring to how Superman uses solar energy. I am definitely not saying that the energy he captured is stored as electricity. I am currently just quantifying the raw power that can be captured by an object of Superman's size. Also note that Superman is mostly light-colored, meaning he reflects light away. A larger black object, such as a roof, would receive much more solar energy than Superman, not enough energy to move a planet. Superman is also never fully exposed to the sun, clothing, his cape, and the fact that half his body is always turned away reduce his effective absorption area. This suggests he might be operating more like a 1.25 square meter solar panel with the edges being less efficient because they are not flat. In fact, very little of a human's irregular surface is perpendicular to the sun. We could hypothesize that he actively vacuums in solar energy, including meager X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays. But sucking in energy would result in him appearing distorted or completely black, as he would absorb all light. People near him would also feel cold and shaded on the sides that face him. Superman could potentially absorb neutrinos from the sun, and DC lore could make neutrinos from a yellow sun unique. Neutrinos are produced abundantly by the sun as a byproduct of nuclear fusion reactions occurring in its core, where hydrogen nuclei fuse into helium, releasing energy in the form of neutrinos. These neutrinos pass through us without interacting. If Superman is a natural sieve for them and stores this theoretical fusion energy output from the sun, it would be significant. Approximately 65 billion solar neutrinos pass through each square centimeter of our bodies every second. Detecting these neutrinos is challenging, but experiments such as the Super Kimio Candy Detector in Japan and the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada have studied them, providing valuable insights into solar physics and particle physics. On Earth's surface, the atmosphere protects us from much of the sun's ionizing radiation, equivalent to about four feet of lead or 10 feet of water. That's right. Water can block radiation and serve as shielding for long space missions. Outer space is very radioactive, so there's a good reason to stock up on water. In space, Superman will absolutely receive more X-rays, gamma rays, and UV radiation, despite not receiving any higher level of neutrinos directly from the sun. When Superman dips into space for a quick recharge, he receives only about one-third more visible light. However, he'd receive significantly more X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays, which Earth's atmosphere almost completely blocks at different levels. There are also some types of UV that are 100% blocked. Over his lifetime, the energy he absorbs and doesn't expend can be stored, as some storylines suggest. He can deplete these solar reserves by overusing his heat vision, though its depiction is often inconsistent. On the CBS show, Supergirl defeated the Red Tornado with her eye beams and was completely drained in under a minute. At other times, like when Superman fought Zod, there seems to be no end to eye beams. Hollywood's love for eye beams is endless. Whether it's the threat of an eye beam, useless eye beams on opponents who aren't armed by heat, or even have the same power of the inevitable and actually impossible to maintain simultaneous eye beam. Look at Icarus. He really lays on the eye beam when dealing with deviants, and it barely harms them. But still the eye beams keep coming, whether it's Superman, or Zod, or Icarus, or Homelander, or Butcher, likely stems from ease of creating the special effect. It's much easier to have a man make a face and superimpose an animation coming out of his eyes than a choreograph a super fight. Superman can also expel his energy explosively, leaving him temporarily powerless. The problem with some writers is the inconsistent portrayal of his recharge rate, varying from a day to instantaneous. Given his inherent Kryptonian strength, we can accept some variation. However, the question to ask is how much solar energy do you need to lift a battleship or pull a planet? A mere day seems very short. At his size, he's getting a sliver of the power emanating from the sun. Superman is using calories to work. There is no way around it. The power comes from somewhere. You have to soak up a lot of sun or eat a lot of burgers to lift a submarine. One notable example of Superman needing to eat to replenish his powers occurs in Action Comics number 454, 
1975, titled Superman's Energy Crisis. In this story, Superman's solar energy is being drained by a mysterious force, leaving him weakened. To compensate, he consumes an enormous amount of food, famously eating hamburgers at a rate of 60 per minute, to restore his energy temporarily. In this story, he mentions that he had to spend an entire paycheck on food to sustain himself. But where does all this power come from? The character has grown much more powerful since the 1960s, often referred to as a god. Modern Hollywood frequently includes Christomessianic imagery, though his actual creators designed him after Moses. Today, portraying Superman being harmed or defeated is almost controversial. When shot point-blank in the eye with a high-caliber pistol, the focus isn't just on the gun's effect, but his reflexes. How could someone not blink when a gun blast touches their eyelashes and a slug hits their eyeball? It's believable for Superman to survive the impact, but he should at least flinch. This sensitivity was addressed in Man of Steel where he grunts when hit by 50... <laughs> Hollywood is even starting to portray Darkseid as a peer for Superman. Darkseid is a non-corporeal entity who doesn't exist in the DC multiverse. His mere presence would destroy universes. Only his avatar, a representation of him, exists in the DC universe. Darkseid's avatar channels a tiny fraction of Darkseid's power, but poses a formidable challenge, requiring the combined efforts of the entire Justice League just to survive. Darkseid quickly overpowered Superman, utterly brainwashed him, and unleashed Superman on Earth. However, newer writers, whom I sometimes refer to as worshippers, refuse to allow Superman any superior. It's no big deal now for Superman to defeat Darkseid. It's just a tough fight, as if Darkseid has been reduced in rank to a Lobo level. It's not any augmented Superman or a Superman with a special weapon or a Superman who soaked himself inside the sun for a year before fighting. That Superman I can see fighting Darkseid Superman can now regularly defeat Darkseid just by being angry, by not holding back. Darkseid stays away from Earth, not because the new gods have Earth under their protection. No, Darkseid is afraid of a single angry Kryptonian. The narrative depends on the writer. I have a preference for the earlier version of Superman, who displayed vulnerability in his battles against adversaries, such as Lobo. When you're actually afraid that your hero can die or fail, the movie is more compelling. The initial confrontations with Lobo were reminiscent of Hulk's first encounters with Wolverine. Wolverine initially appeared as a formidable new antagonist for Hulk, with the potential to kill Hulk, which he accomplished in a what-if comic. Historically, both Hulk's and Superman's skin were considered absolutely impenetrable, with Wolverine's attacks being futile. Over time, narratives evolved, and both Hulk and Superman will bleed relatively often. This context explains my disappointment with Steppenwolf's attack on Superman. especially in the same film where Darkseid suffered an actual injury from an axe wielded by young Ares to the shoulder. Lobo was that way at first. He was actually scary. When people first read him, he read like Doomsday. This guy might actually take out Superman. Now, he's more of a nuisance. The current version of Superman, who dispatches such foes effortlessly, makes for less compelling stories. A Superman who faces real challenges like in the Justice League Unlimited Animated Series, is more relatable. Superman's journey involves overcoming struggle, which is essential for a hero's story. However, even the original Superman was fundamentally not human. Alera on the Orville was like 1939 Superman, insanely strong because she was from a high-gravity planet. But she can easily be killed with the right weapon. The 1939 Superman doesn't require a yellow sun to stomp most criminals. So in that scene from Superman 2, when Clark gives up his powers and then gets beat up in a diner, he should have still been able to easily overpower the man in the diner. 
He would just be unable to fly or use heat vision, and his strength would have been closer to Spider-Man than a god. He could lift locomotives, not planets. And even if he weren't a being from a higher gravity planet, even if he were completely human, Clark Kent is just plain a beefy and fit guy. He should not be easily bullied, even without powers. I would love to see a Superman who is dying while being exposed to kryptonite snap the neck of a villain who dares get too close. It is worth noting that very few storylines explore Clark Kent as a formidable man in his own right. Without powers, he should be stronger than Spider-Man and have much tougher skin. As seen in the Justice League Unlimited episode Hereafter, Season 2, Episodes 19 and 20, where Toy Man's weapon sends a powerless Superman to the future, he was able to fight off and tame a pack of wolves without injury. Ultimately, Superman's powers should be grounded with real limits. Seeing him struggle to pull apart the mother box was great, but casually taking an axe to the shoulder from Steppenwolf was not great for me at all. Then the casual freezing of the axe, as if it were a mere T-1000? No. Traditionally, Superman has a tough time with Darkseid and even his minions. I'm particularly intrigued by the neutrino angle. If, for some reason, neutrinos interacted with him, they could be a unique power source. Wouldn't it be interesting if Superman also interacted with dark matter? Imagine him flying with the Justice League. And while no one else feels a thing, he feels increasing drag, heat up, and then suddenly he's thrown from the ship, breaching the hull, because dark matter interacts with him. He would have to worry about high-speed travel through space because at any moment he could slam into or burn up a dark matter then has to worm his way out of a thick vein of dark matter like molasses that no one else can see or feel. The dark matter would clog his throat, and he can't communicate clearly even though there is plenty of air in his lungs. But his vocal cords won't vibrate correctly against the dark matter. But who am I to impose my fan fiction ideas? I don't write comic books, but I did stay in a Holiday and Express last week. Let me know your thoughts. Please like, subscribe, and share. Mm -hmm.